Williams and hosted by the Oxford Mindfulness Foundation. I am Makeda McKenzie, and if you're trying to place the accent, I am joining today from Trinidad and Tobago, where I'm from and where I live. I am one of the teachers and trainers here at the OMF, as well as one of the new trustees to the board and an appointment I'm very excited about. And I'm delighted to be co-hosting this evening with my dear colleague, Leonie, for what I'm sure will be an inspiring and illuminated talk by Mark. Leonie, can I invite you to say a few words here? Thank you so much, Makeda, and warm greetings to all of you. Really nice to see some familiar faces appearing. My name is Leonie. I'm also new to the Board of Trustees at the OMF. I'm a mindfulness trainer, um, but I have a corporate background. I worked for a management consultant for many years in, in London, but these days my family and I live in Berlin in Germany. And having introduced ourselves, we would like to invite you to introduce yourself using the chat. Um, so if you're willing, um, feel free to put in the chat. We'll say hello to each other and let us know where you're joining us from today, what country, um, what city. Maybe let us know if you're at home or if you're joining us from somewhere else. Wonderful. And I see lots and lots of um, responses coming in. We have so many people here today that it's almost hard to follow, but I hope you can get a sense of the, the variety, the diversity of cities and countries. Um, so that's, that's really wonderful um, to see. Belarus, I caught there, Lebanon, wow. Ireland, Kenya. New York City, I think I saw. Japan. I do wonder how many different countries are, are here today. Amazing. Qatar. Yeah. I'm sure it's really early or really late for some of you, so really appreciate you joining us, making the time. Um, and I think in a moment, Makeda, I'll hand back to you if that's okay for some, some housekeeping, some info before we start. Yes, thanks, Leonie. So just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Please do keep your microphone muted unless you're invited to speak. The chat will be open during the session. So please share your questions for Mark there as they arrive. The OMF team will be gathering questions as we go along and theming them for presenting to Mark at the end. And as it relates to the chat, please do not use the chat to answer questions posted for Mark or as a forum to chat among yourselves as this can be distracting for all. There will be time for question and answers at the end and due to the large numbers of people, Leone and I will be presenting the questions to Mark. Yeah. Thanks, Leonie. And now I'd like to um, welcome Mark Williams, our guest speaker today. Welcome him back. Um, Mark is a dear friend of the OMF. He's the founder of the Oxford Mindfulness Foundation, and he's a co-creator of the MBCT program. And today he will be introducing us to the topic of deeper mindfulness, New, a new way of rediscovering calm in a chaotic world. The title and the subject of his new book, which he co-authored with Danny Penman. So without further ado, over to you, Mark. Thank you, Leonie. Thank you, Makeda. So let's start by sitting for a moment to help gather ourselves and arrive here. So if it's possible, if you've got notebooks, just putting them down for a moment, letting your eyes close if that feels comfortable or just lowering your gaze. And if it's possible, with the feet flat on the floor. 
and the back straight and feeling the chair or whatever you're sitting on against your back or against the sit bones. And gathering the attention and placing it on the breath for a few moments, somewhere where you feel the breath moving in and out of the body. Often when we sit like this, it's not long before we realize the weather pattern of mind and body, whether we are restless or agitated right now, whether we've got a lot on our mind or, or feeling quite calm and relaxed and see if what's coming, what's arising for you in this moment. As we sit here, focusing on the breath. receiving each in-breath and letting go on each out-breath. Maybe noticing the shoulders drop on the out-breath or the facial expression become softer. And if the mind is very restless now, then feeling free to allow your attention to focus on perhaps the feet on the floor, either along with the breath or just, just the feet by themselves as your anchor right now. Exploring what it's like to focus on the feet with the with a breath in the background or combining the breath with the feet. And if the mind wanders away from where you had intended it to be at any time, no rush, no need to rush back to the anchor, to the breath or the feet. Just taking a pause and in that pause, just acknowledging what the mind's trying to do, bringing a sense of understanding and kindness, perhaps even thanking the mind for what it's trying to do to remind you of things. And then having thanked the mind or appreciated the mind, then very slowly coming back to the breath or to the feet. And as we bring this short practice to an end, just acknowledging the sense of the breath and the feet and other parts of the body being available to us at any time to ground ourselves. So that when the mind is restless, we've got somewhere to come back to. A place of calmness. And now beginning to move fingers and toes and if your eyes have been closed, allowing them to open and taking in your surroundings again.
So thanks again for inviting me for this evening. And what I'd like to do is a number of things to talk about or to sample parts of the book, the, the Deeper Mindfulness book. Mindfulness is about turning the light of uh, awareness towards what's arising outside us and inside us moment by moment. And the program in Deeper Mindfulness aims us to continue that task, to help us see more and more clearly what keeps us locked in brooding and worry and prevents us seeing where deep calmness and well-being might lie. And it starts with the observation that emotional problems have certain key characteristics. They hijack our attention. They make us grouchy and judgmental from time to time. They knock us off balance. And our minds can end up racing, racing, racing with over busyness that leaves us exhausted and joyless. Now, these moods, they can seem relentless, but they're actually made up of a series of moments which, if only we could slow things down frame by frame, we'd see as a continuously refreshing cycle again and again and again. And the important thing about these cycles is that each one, each cycle, is refreshing itself, influenced by something that has arisen in the mind or the body that is known as the feeling tone, that is the sense of pleasantness or unpleasantness, or somewhere in between, fairly neutral or neither one or the other. And this feeling tone is known in the Buddhist tradition as Vedana, V-E-D-A-N-A, -A, Vedana. So today I'd like to say what feeling tone is and why it's important. And then second, how to turn towards feeling tone and see how it affects our perception of, of, of reality. And third, to explore a way of dealing skillfully with the over busy mind. And then we'll have some breakout rooms and uh, at certain points uh, a couple of times during the evening so you can talk with each other. Um, but first of all, what is feeling tone? So feeling tone is the immediate automatic sense that something is pleasant, unpleasant or neither when you come into contact with it. So to get a, a sense of feeling tone, maybe take a minute now and just look around the room wherever you're sitting right now. And as your eye alights on different objects, as you just move your eye around the room, see if you can sense as your eye focuses on each object, whether it has an immediate feel of pleasantness or unpleasantness or somewhere in between, it's neutral. And if you wish, you could put in the chat what you've noticed, maybe a picture, pleasant, just P for pleasant maybe, or unpleasant, or uh, U for unpleasant, N for neutral, but say, as obviously you don't have to say very much, but just picture or photo, pleasant, or pile of stuff, unpleasant, or whatever. So the plant, the room is pleasant, the Christmas tree, a stain, unpleasant, colour of the wall, a messy desk. There's several messy desks being revealed. Um, pictures, untidy desk again. How is it that people can see my desk as well? Electric power thing on the wall, unpleasant, fresh air. And as, again, another stain, a cake, a crib, a dog, a fireplace, a clust clutter of envelopes, unpleasant, face of the dog, a wedding photo, an empty tin of beans. I'm not sure that was rated pleasant or unpleasant. Yeah. Post-it, bike helmet, a block of electrical equipment that I don't understand. <laughs> Thank you for that. That's wonderful. Yes. Washing error, very unpleasant. Music scores, pleasant. A letter, a sleeping dog. So there. Thank you. We'll close the chat in a few moments, or at least a cluttered desk. We assume from Maya that that might be unpleasant. Santa has just called to Arlene. Well, that's nice. I hope that was pleasant. 
So there we are. Notice how, notice how these are unique to you. If anybody else had seen those, they might not have had the same reaction. Um, they're unique to you. And although you're aware of the feeling tone now that you sort of look at it, at some level, whenever you've been sitting in that room in the last day, two, three days, they're always there. They're always there in the background and they're having that sort of effect, even if we're not aware of it. What we've been doing now is we've been bringing them into awareness. And actually, feeling tones may arise and pass away so quickly that it can be difficult to notice them. And yet they're critically important because very often they shape what happens next. So if you found just now that some things, as many of you said, gave a pleasant feeling tone, you may have noticed a pulse of reactivity to it, like a picture, as somebody mentioned, it might have reminded you of someone or something precious. And your mind might have just briefly have gone off into daydreams or, or pleasant memories, maybe sometimes regrets. Um, but if you found out just now that some things gave an unpleasant feeling tone, um, there were piles, there was un lots of messy desks there, there was electrical equipment that people didn't understand maybe, um, or something it might have reminded you of something you'd meant to do, but you haven't got round to. And you might notice that reactivity pulse of aversion and pushing away resistance. And, and if there was nothing pleasant or unpleasant, you might have found yourself tuning out or getting a little bored or hoping that I would hurry up and get on to the next thing. Um, I have to say that for most of us, the hurry up mind is a pretty constant visitor. So here's the important thing. The feeling tone of any moment can be the tipping point for the quality of the next moment. So while every sensation or thought has a feeling tone, and in that moment it can't be changed, the reactions in the very next moment are potentially changeable. So mindful awareness of the feeling tone of experience offers a point of entry into the habitual cycles of reactivity that occur in emotional distress. If we were able to cultivate greater awareness of the feeling tone, it might have enormous potential. We'd have early warning signs of impending impulses to act in certain ways, impending thoughts, impending emotional reactions, and therefore more choice about how best to respond. So if we want to deepen our mindfulness practice, to free ourselves from the moods that continue to afflict us despite our best efforts, including all our meditation experience. Cultivating awareness of feeling tone provides a key. As mindfulness teacher Joseph Goldstein says, and I, I love this quote, that mindfulness of feeling tone is one of the master keys that both reveals and unlocks the deepest patterns of our conditioning. And so now, although it's quite early on in our session, I want to suggest that we go into breakout rooms and I'll hand over um, to the team to put us in breakout rooms, to put you in breakout rooms. It may be four, five, six. I'm not quite sure exactly how many, um, but use them for four or five minutes to share as much or as little as you wish of what you noticed as you looked around your room, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. How easy was it to notice the feeling tone and any reactions you became aware of, as much or as little as you wish? Um, good luck and we'll meet back here at about uh, <coughs> three minutes, 23 minutes, maybe 23 and a half minutes past the hour. So thank you to the team for organising that. Quite a feat. I want to now turn to feeling tone in more detail and how it affects our perception of reality. When we started putting this programme together, which is in the Deeper Mindfulness book, we called it, as you may know, frame by frame. And the reference was to photographer Edward Maybridge, a pioneer in 1877, who used 12 cameras carefully positioned along a racetrack to settle an argument that had raged for centuries. Was there any moment in the gallop of a horse when all four hooves were off the ground simultaneously? So a thread ran across, ran across the track from each camera, and as the horse ran past, it broke the threads and released each camera's shutter. Each shutter was a thousandth of a second. 
And when the photographs were developed, they revealed the answer, yes, there was a brief moment when the horse floated above the ground. And the use of this new technology allowed Maybridge to capture this new view, frame by frame, which no one had seen before. Now, how is this relevant? How is it relevant to our mindfulness? Because in mindfulness, in mindfulness practice, we too, in a sense, are slowing things down so we can get nearer and nearer to seeing individual frames of experience. And neuroscience agrees that the brain is constantly active, building this sequence of mental models, a bit like Maybridge's sequence of images. But there's a difference. Edward Maybridge's camera took a series of pictures of what was actually there. But the pictures in your mental models in your head aren't like that at all. They contain predictions and plans on the basis of what's happened in the past. And this is because mental models are what you might call task models. They're blueprints of actions to be taken to minimize error in pursuit of your goals. So one way to understand it is to imagine that any first image in a series is based on data from the world, the actual data, but the images that follow later in the sequence are internally generated based on matching up that first image with similar images from your own past, drawn down from your memory and drawn by whatever goal you have right now and the action that seems most relevant to that goal. So it's as if we've got two parallel streams in the brain. One is the basic data stream that is monitoring the actual world. The other is a virtual video stream. And this virtual stream this rapid sequence of mental models is constructed from the predictions of what's likely to happen from one moment to the next, based on what's happened in the past and what action is needed. And all, crucially, influenced by the feeling tone of what's happening, especially when we get caught up in the complexities of brooding or worry. In that circumstance, feeling tone is like a hidden organizer. It directs the operations within this sequence of mental models. For example, it determines which experiences are key and should be held in mind, often the most unpleasant, the peak of your pain, the peak of your distress. So if you're not aware of it, it acts like glue holding the sequence of images and plans together to predict more pain and more distress in the next moment. But here's the thing, if we can become aware of what's happening and simply say, ah, oh, this is unpleasant, this is unpleasant, it can cut through the complexity of the whole thing and the sequence of images, the sequence of sort of images that you've created uh, in the mind collapses. I want to try this for two or three minutes now. You could close your eyes if you like. We'll just do a, a short meditation in which we do what we did before, but we do it inside. Before we, we looked around the room to look for pleasant or unpleasant life. Now we close our eyes and we go inside. So if you're willing to close your eyes or just lower your gaze, just notice what, well, We've said it before, what's the weather pattern like now in terms of thoughts that might be going through your mind? Or body sensations? Or feelings? Maybe just starting with body sensations and as you are aware of body sensations, just noticing is this sensation pleasant or unpleasant or neither? Maybe sensations from your legs or the upper part of the body, shoulders, neck, head, wherever. Whatever's coming into your awareness, sensations pleasant or unpleasant? Or neither.
and there may be sounds as well. Include those if there are sounds around and just do the same thing as you register sounds, register pleasantness or unpleasantness as well. Is it pleasant, unpleasant or neither? And then any thoughts or feelings that are around. Are they pleasant or unpleasant or somewhere in between? Now notice how the thoughts, feelings, body sensations, whatever comes into contact with mind or body has a feeling tone, but it may be very subtle, may not be very obvious at all. If anything occurs that you don't not quite sure, then just letting it go and just waiting for something else to happen. And there's no need to analyze what comes up, simply seeing if you can get that immediate sense, the sort of gut level sense of pleasantness or unpleasantness. And if there are lots to choose from, just pick one and work with that. One sensation or one thought or one feeling. And then when you're ready, moving fingers and toes and letting your eyes open if they've been closed, taking in the room again. So here's the thing that that's important that feeling tones can press our buttons, but particularly when you're not aware of them. This is why we're practicing being more aware of them. Um, if we have an unpleasant sensation or thought, the mind can get into a mode of resistance and pushing away. And the pushing away itself can be unpleasant. So that added unpleasantness becomes part of your task model, the mental model, and it brings up more unpleasant things. So that's um, that gets us into a bit of a tangle. It's interesting with pleasant feeling tones. Often we, we've been taught in our practice that if something pleasant happens, we become attached to it. But actually, it's not always the case. Sometimes when something pleasant occurs, we find ourselves enjoying something. We actually damp down our enjoyment so as not to be disappointed later. Um, so people have develop questionnaires to look at this and you might be interested in some of the items from that so one item is when you feel happy excited or enthused so think of times when you feel happy excited or enthused about something do you what do you say to yourself do you say to yourself things like these feelings won't last or this could go wrong or do you think my streak of luck is going to end soon or I don't deserve this, or this is too good to be true. Those are all items from this questionnaire. This assess what's called dampening. And it's if it's if we worry so much about being let down by positive mood, we try to get in our disappointment first before it can happen to us. But the problem is that, that dampening makes depression more likely. If we think if we enjoy this moment, something will go wrong, we cut ourselves off from things that might nourish us. So it helps to practice allowing the feeling tone to be just as it is, especially with positive things, pleasant things, but actually it's good for unpleasant things as well. And there's a way we have learned to do this and which I'd like to recommend to you so that if you come across a pleasant thing, a pleasant feeling tone, a pleasant feeling, a pleasant sensation, after you've acknowledged it, saying inwardly, it's okay to like this. This can help dissolve the dampening, dissolve the reactivity, and you can enjoy it and savour it while it's here without getting attached to it. And actually, this also really is helpful for unpleasant things too. After you've acknowledged it, if you say inwardly, this is unpleasant, it's okay not to like it. It's natural not to like this. This also can dissolve the reactivity, letting go of that part of the task model that 
feels it wants to hang on to something distressing, it just dissolves. And this dissolves the reactivity by helping us to see that it's natural not to like unpleasant things. So I want to now just continue, just go back into that meditation and to add those instructions. So I want to go back into body sensations, thoughts, feelings, if, you, if you're willing to do this. If you haven't, if you're too tired right now or too overwhelmed by something going on in your life, then either just sitting it out or staying with your anchors, the feet on the floor or the body on the chair or your breath. Um, but if you're um, up for this, let's see what happens if we just sit and add those instructions. So coming to sit. And once again, starting with body sensations, knowing first where our anchors are that we can come back to the feet on the floor or the breath. But now at a certain point, noticing the body sensations. And if any body sensation that you notice is pleasant, acknowledging it, ah, pleasant, and then adding, it's okay to like this. And if anybody's sensation is unpleasant right now, acknowledging this too, this is unpleasant. And adding, it's okay, it's natural. It's okay not to like this. It's natural not to like what's unpleasant. And we're not saying the pain or discomfort is okay. We're saying that it's, it's okay not to like the pain, discomfort. It's okay not to like it. And then turning, as we did last time, to thoughts and feelings that might be around. Worries or regrets or the to-do list that we're concerned about. And if thoughts, feelings come up, just noticing. Pleasant, unpleasant or neither. And if a pleasant thought or feeling comes, adding, it's okay to like this. And if it's unpleasant, it's okay not to like this. In this way, we're exploring both the effect of registering, becoming aware of feeling tone, and the effect of allowing it. And now, at a certain point, just moving fingers and toes, and opening your eyes if they've been closed, and taking in your surroundings again. And we're going to go straight into breakout rooms now. And once again, just share as much or as little as you want to about any discoveries or difficulties with that practice. And uh, we'll come back in three or four minutes. Just so very brief breakout rooms now. Thank you. So just a final word before the Q&A. And this is concerns the over busy mind. And we've said that every moment the brain and body are constantly active, monitoring changes in the world outside and inside. And all the time this is happening, the body is actually allocating resources to maintain a balance as best it can as a homeostasis. And these adjustment of resources that's constantly going on has been called the body budget. And that's going on in the body, but it's going on in the mind as well, without our being aware of it. The mind is sorting out memories of what we've done today and last week. It retains records of what you've planned to do. It begins to get busy to take action, which then affects the body budget. 
without your being conscious of many of these processes. And much of this busyness goes on at the very fringes of consciousness. Most of our imagined actions never pass the threshold needed for actual action, but they still take up resources. It's like a smartphone where an app is still running in the background, even when we're not using it. And we find the battery is at 5% halfway through the day. We can ourselves find ourselves running on 5% too. And because of the moment by moment ebb and flow arises from the body mind gearing up for action, when the mind feels very busy or lost in thought or an emotion, whether it's in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day, it can be really helpful to say inwardly on an out breath, no action needed right now. So just before we go into the Q&A, let's explore for a moment what happens when you say, however you are right now, on an out breath, no action needed right now. Just try out this new phrase inwardly as we sit here, just as you are, closing your eyes if that feels comfortable, stepping inside, seeing the weather pattern, and whatever is going on with you right now, on an out breath, saying to yourself, no action needed right now. No action needed in this moment. No action needed right now. So this is not invitation to be passive, but to just let go of the, all these accumulated actions we don't need to take in order that wise action can emerge and be seen clearly when it needs to be. So thank you very much uh, for doing that little experiment and for all your work in the breakout rooms. And there's one or two questions already come in for our last 10 minutes here. So I'm going to hand over now to uh, the team who are going to collect the questions. Thank you so much, Mark. That's been so helpful, um, so insightful and, and so actionable um, as well. We'll move on to Q&A now, um, and I think a few questions have already come in. So here's one for you, Mark. This person says, I'm currently halfway through the new book, and I have trouble simply noticing the feeling tone of things. I always feel like I'm evaluating the thing. Why am I feeling like that, rather than the actual sense? So this is a very, very common thing that happens, that the mind is so, so keen to evaluate and compare and so on and contrast that it's very difficult to look at body sensations, sounds and so on without getting a, a sense of why am I doing this? You could almost see those why thoughts as like satellites that are sent off and it's, they revolve around and around the mind, around the thing that it is you're trying to focus on. So... Um, if you continue to do this, um, then uh, and to notice when you get that evaluation sort of going on, see if it is possible to see to ask yourself, is that evaluation itself pleasant or unpleasant? Very often it feels a bit contracted, a bit unpleasant, and you get an immediate sense: ah, this thing that my mind is doing is actually unpleasant. Another thing is to imagine that somebody's throwing you a ball and, and you, you're catching the ball and you know instant whether it's hard or soft. So it's a sort of seeing if you can get to that gut level sense of things, going to the senses. And then when your mind starts up, just smiling inwardly saying, hi, I notice you. Uh, it's a little unpleasant to be doing that. Let's see if I can go back to what I had intended to be doing. But good luck with that. It's a very common thing. So don't worry if it if it comes. Um, it will uh, get better with practice. Thanks, Mark, very reassuring. Um, and one more question here. Um, so this person says, as the body is allocating resources all the time, do we get tired? Yes. And, and indeed, part of the tiredness comes from the body allocating resources all the time. And so, um, the balance of the body 
uh, is that's why we we need to take brain breaks. We need to take breaks. Um, that's why if we've been, say, on a long journey and we haven't been doing anything, we're tired at the end of it, partly because we've had lots of time to think about things and just thinking about things and enacts possible actions. And it it, it has. Um, and as we get tireder, it's more difficult to inhibit those actions from coming into consciousness. So it is it is tiring being awake. Um, and uh, that's why it's nice sometimes if we can to sleep. Um, so it's going on all the time and it does tend to exhaust us. Thanks, Mark. And I have a question for you. What is it that makes a difference to our next moment? Is it purely shining the light of awareness onto the feeling tone and then allowing it? Yeah. So the the awareness itself deautomatizes what has been automatic. So the the linking together of these models in this sort of a clinch from moment to moment comes from the whole thing just proceeding automatically. Um, so uh, the uh, when you shine the light of awareness on it, awareness deautomatizes or uncouples, and so therefore. The, the whatever was stored as the sort of peak distress that you then think I've got to work on this, then it, it's like in a cache, it just empties the cache and it no longer has that grip on you. So it, it, it reduces the urgency and the direction of travel of, of a, a attachment or aversion. Excellent. Thanks, Mark. And another question coming in is, how does recognizing a pleasant feeling tone differ from savoring? Um, it doesn't really. I mean, recognizing a pleasant feeling tone is, is, is savoring, as it were. But the savoring refers to allowing it so that we could recognize it, but we could still react to it with, I want more of this. Um, however, if you, if you hold it in this... Um, uh, kind awareness it's less likely to to create this attachment um but the the idea of saying ah this is pleasant and it's okay to like it is to allow you to savor it without getting hijacked by a sense of i want more of this and so on so you can savor it while it's here without wanting more of it thank you mark and i think we have time for another question um can you hear me? You can hear me. Um, so that question is, when I say it's okay to pleasant and joyful experiences, I feel it's not as natural as saying it, it's okay to something unpleasant. So what is the purpose of saying okay to something pleasant? Because we actually get out of the habit of doing it. Often we've been, I mean, if I was brought up in a lovely, happy family home. I'm very lucky I was. But even so, my mum used to say, oh, don't get your hopes up or there'll be tears by bedtime if we got excited, too overexcited because I was one of five children. Right. So she had to sort of manage us a bit like half a football team. And so don't get your hopes up or, you know, it'd be tears by bedtime were her ways of trying to dampen our excitement, which is fine. But this tends to then get conditioned into us so that. When something pleasant happens, it's really easy to say, oh, no, no, better not. I can't trust my positive feelings. So it's really, really good that you notice that it's not doesn't feel as natural. It shows actually how rusty we often are and how lovely it is to actually spend time um, uh, when something pleasant happens, just to stop and take a pause and say, oh, pleasant. It's OK to like this and to get into a new habit with it. Lovely. Thank you, Mark. And, and one more question here that's really interesting. Um, does categorizing experience into pleasant, unpleasant and neutral go against our efforts to try to be non-judgmental in our experience? It's a really good question. We're not actually asking you to judge them. It's more like discernment than judgment. So um, the point about this is that Vedana or feeling tone comes with experience. It's there naturally. And so we're not trying to add anything. Judgment tends to add things like comparing it with things. Is this good or bad? Will this serve me or not? Pleasant or unpleasant comes with the territory of experience. And just like if you taste sour milk and you don't like it, 
um, you're not sort of, as it were, making a judgment. I mean, you might make a judgment about the people who left it in the fridge, but you're not making a judgment about the sour. You just know instantly that's that's an unpleasant taste. And so the taste comes. It's in fact, taste is a good analogy for this. It's like the taste of things, not so much a judgment as the taste of experience, the flavor of experience. And it comes with experience. And therefore, if we don't see it, we're sort of just not seeing the whole picture of our lives. Thank you, Mark. Okay, do I have we time for one more? Oh, I'm, okay, I'm afraid not, Naomi. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of our time together. I know the questions are coming in fast and furious into the chat. It's been such a inspiring talk, a motivating talk. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time and attention. And especially thank you to me. Thank you, Mark, for so generously giving up your time and your wisdom and your expertise and for facilitating such an inspiring talk and question and answer session. I think we have all learned a lot more about deeper mindfulness and feeling tone and the practices that you've offered have left us feeling nourished and uplifted, grounded and empowered. And we have some resources that we're very happy to share with you all. And the links will be dropped into the chat now. As it relates to the book, Deeper Mindfulness, The New Way to Rediscover Calm in a Chaotic World, co-authored by Mark. We have link, a link where you can purchase it online, and that will be shared in the chat. And if you're interested in enrolling in the courses related to this book, either as a participant or as a mindfulness teacher who wants to train to teach deeper mindfulness, we have links for those as well, which we'll share in the chat. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, Leonie, for your excellent co-hosting duties. Maybe you could say some final words here. Thank you, Makeda. It's been a pleasure to co-host with you. And I wanted to say thank you to the OMF team as well, who've been working hard in the background to make uh, this session happen. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a fascinating hour. I've learned so much. Um, and thank you all for your presence and for your curiosity in, in this topic of deeper mindfulness. Um, and as we close the session, I'd like to invite you to, if, if you choose to unmute yourself and to say goodbye to this community of mindfulness friends in your own native language.